are locked with a view of the surveillance cameras hidden in it. The rusted looking door of M11537 slowly locks onto our ship, automated thrusters near the doors of each vessel jiggling them together. Wherever the maintenance ship goes is where we go at this point. Now this story is kind of like a ac action, horror, science fiction kind of thing, and I started it in my science fiction class is where I got the idea, because, you know, a relevant topic and all that. And uh, we had to do a short story for our final grade in that class. And, uh, you know, I just kind of like, one kid in the class came up with this idea. It would kind of spoil the story, but I thought, hey, why don't I just do that? And I was thinking about it the whole quarter, and then I busted that out in about a week. It was one of the, it's about 27, 29 pages long, and uh, I was just really into it. It went really fluently. The plot isn't that complicated. Uh, so, yeah, it was a good first story to have. I learned a lot about myself as a writer, what I wanted to change later on. It was from first person and all that. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of this one, so there you go. So then, writing to me. So the first thing I hear when I mention my project is 225 pages. You really wrote that much, and yes, I did. But I could only do that because it's something I'm passionate about. It's something I actually enjoy doing, and it's something I feel like I'm being productive doing. It's not something I just do to waste time like video games or whatever, which I might just drop or uninstall or install another one or watch a TV show halfway through and then get disinterested. This is the one thing I can stick with because it's, it's true to me. It's something I found that, you know, means something. So, I started because I wanted to make something of my own. As I mentioned, just watching so much other media made by other people, like, uh, you know, video games or like TV shows, especially Game of Thrones because I like the, uh, the setting and all that, but it's a little bit too depressing for me, you know? And I don't like how I don't have any influence whatsoever on the way that the plot progresses. So I said, why don't I just make something of my own? I couldn't find like something exactly that I wanted to read or watch, so just make my own kind of thing. So, yeah. That's about it on that part. So I'm going to read an excerpt from my second story, which took a lot longer to write because it was a bit more complicated, a bit longer. This one was 40 pages, and uh, this is fantasy versus science fiction. So this is pretty much the beginning page, so you're not missing anything like with the last one. I stand in the doorway of a one-room cabin in the middle of a dense forest, a short distance from a small village. It is a humble dwelling with a bed mounted to the wall, a stack of logs outside of it, and a meager kitchen complete with shelves and a range along one of its narrow walls. Beneath me is a man's corpse. He lies face down, his limbs sprawled across the ground. His twisted posture indicates a horrible death. His clothing is tattered and dirty. He was a man past his prime, but not quite elderly. Clearly there was nothing to steal from him but the woodcutter's axe and his rigid hands, marking a vain attempt at self-defense. The man bleeds heavily from a deep gash across his back. The one attack was all that was needed to fell him, severing his spine. No part of him was eaten, and nothing was removed from this place. My hands clench slowly into fists, and then begin shaking as I process the scene. I click my tongue in spite and start growling. My teeth grind into each other, and my unblinking eyes sting with dryness and anger. I was too late. Chaos. Destruction without purpose. A farmer that sows rotten vegetables into his neighbor's land. The force that I swore my life to combat. The unforgivable, undefinable, ubiquitous force that descends into the world from every possible direction. It comes in the form of natural disasters, the latent wickedness of man, and worst of all, in its most direct and most accurate manifestation, monsters. Hollow creatures that can resemble humans in shape, powerful and horrifying, able to dispatch entire legions of men, sometimes fallen shadows that were once human beings, sometimes physical evil generated in the dark corners of the world, but always a lamentable scourge, a threat to every woman and child, no matter how many walls and spears they are hidden behind. I move the dead man outside and take off his clothing. I sprinkle blessed water over his bare skin. Then I take the still-lit lantern from his cabin and use it to burn the gashes on his back until they are charred and black. Wrapping the corpse in a white burial cloth from my pack, I dig a deep trench in the ground just behind the hut and lay him on the bottom. Putting my hands together, I compose a prayer for him, taking solace in the fact that the funeral will no doubt, no doubt guide his soul to safety. I know this because it has not been long since this man died. I adorn the dead man's ragged clothing, leaving my armor inside the cabin. The linen of the outfit is crusty and discolored. Its owner was a man that worked every single day to earn a living. He did not give up despite the hardships of his lifestyle. Even though he lived in poverty, he fought to make the most of it and probably enjoyed life. And then, for no reason, he was killed. I feel a scowling pulse of rage tear out from my heart. It envelops my limbs and my mind, and without realizing it, I have sent out deeper into the woods. I could have saved this man. I snarl when another spike of anger stings me. Why should he have needed saving? Why does there exist evil that would necessitate that? I tear a flask from my pack and pour its contents over my head and chest. Human blood. 
I remove a second vial and empty it over my arms and legs. Newman sweat. The wound on the man's back, as well as the fact that his murder took place in woodland, makes it clear what manner of abomination stalks this forest, a werewolf. An extremely agile predator with devastating claws on its hands and feet and long, curved fangs. Trying to strike one with a ranged weapon would be foolish. At speed, you cannot even track them with your eyes. No armor can block their ferocious attacks, and if you manage to survive being wounded by a werewolf, you are doomed to become one yourself. So, with that story, I use the same uh, perspective that I did with the first one, uh, that is uh, first person, so it's from the protagonist's perspective. And uh, I would say there was more adventure to that one. It was a bit more slow paced because the last one took place on just two ships and this one's across kind of like a small kingdom. And uh, it's, it's more about personal development as well. But the plot was more complex because the character actually kind of changed more so than the other one did as he went along because, you know, he's a bit younger and, uh, you know, he wasn't as set in his ways. So, yeah. And the next story I wrote was a bit of a divergence from that. It uh, takes place in a modern setting. It's a bit more grim than the past two. And uh, I enjoyed that one too. It was dissimilar from anything else I'd ever written because um, it was, first of all, had a female protagonist, and second of all, it had a different perspective. I wrote from third person, that is like everything's observed from some narrator outside the situation. Uh, but before I go over that excerpt, I'm gonna go over what I like the most and dislike the most about writing. So obviously the freedom, you can write whatever. It doesn't have to adhere to uh, you know, the laws of physics or the laws of society, whatever comes to your mind, whatever appeals to you, you can write. You can use whatever sim uh, simile or analogy to make a point. You're not constrained by any rules other than, you know, grammar and spelling. And I also, what I enjoy a lot, maybe the most, is having people read what you've written. Because if they enjoy it and they read it, they're like, this is some pretty good stuff. Even if they have suggestions, they don't think it's perfect. If they got enjoyment out of reading what you wrote, you, it's kind of like validation. Like, you know you're not wasting your time. You're doing something, you're creating something. You really are. It's, it's yours. Nobody else made it. It wouldn't have occurred without you. And that's rewarding. It's productive. And it you know, gives you the motivation to keep going. Because if you were just writing and nobody ever read it, giving you motivation, it would be hard to keep going. But I also do enjoy reading my own work. Because maybe a week or two after I'm done writing something, when I read it through, it, it feels like a finished work. It, like I kind of am a bit detached from it because I'm not currently writing it. I feel like a reader. And when I enjoy it, reading through it like that, I mean, it has to be good. You're not going to enjoy your own writing if it's not good. And that's why editing I don't mind as much either. I just kind of like go through and if I think something doesn't sound right, I'll change it. I don't really rewrite portions of my story that much. I kind of feel bad about that because I feel like I'm taking something important out of the story or I'm diminishing the experience, which is also why I think I might have trouble if I ever want to publish things in the future because I feel like most editors will be like, oh, you know, take this out, don't want this. And since I write mainly for me, it's just like, hey, I can write this because I want to. I want to have the say on the outcome of this. And then somebody else is like, well, I don't like to take it out. Like, I, I have a lot of difficulty with that because that would be me writing for someone else. And which feeds into one of my major dislikes. I do not like writing for deadlines. So that really <laughs> is pretty rough. Because when it gets to like crunch time, you feel like you just got to write. You got to rush and push stuff out. And inherently, rushed writing is not quality writing. I feel like you're writing for someone else once again. You would not be writing in this way, this like kind of stuff, like meant just to progress the plot. You know, it doesn't make any sense because you're trying to put in things that you want to put in, but it doesn't fit this rushed plot line because you're trying to get it finished. So I just feel like that impacts, first of all, the quality, and second of all, the complexity of the story. I need to write when I'm in the mood to write, or it's just not going to be very good. I don't write when I'm angry or sad, because when I'm angry, the writing's too coarse and often riddled with expletives. And when I'm sad, I just don't get in the mood to write. It's very hard to write much because I'm just not motivated. Um, and then I sometimes, <coughs> when I, most of the time when I'm beginning a story, or if I get into like a section that I think maybe isn't profound enough, it's just straight up action or something, I'm like, hey, maybe this isn't any good. And once you get into that train of thought, it's very hard to keep going with the story. A lot of the time I need to just, you know, print out what I have and read through it, kind of like reaffirm, hey, this isn't so bad after all, you know, it's just because I'm in writing it and all that that I think it might not be that great. And you, you need to think that what you're doing is okay to keep on with it. And, uh, Complaining complicated plots is not something I enjoy that much, but I mean, I think it needs to happen. I enjoy the finished product, and that's just something that needs to go on. I mean, I love writing, but that doesn't mean I love every part of writing. So I just get all wound up, and then I write things I want to, but then they don't fit into other things that I, and you know, you need to, you need to just fuse them in the middle, and that takes a lot of time. And also, I don't like writing transitions. Like, you know, they change from this scene to another scene, or they went from this room to this room, or this place across this road to this place, because, I don't know, it just feels stale and it's not interesting to write. Uh, yeah. 
So, I'll read you the third excerpt. Vera wakes up and is again late. Unless she fails to comment on that, however, she understands today is a serious job. Some guys on South Street OD'd on our stuff last night, and word is cops are inbound, he says. One guy says they're looking for a way to get at us. He nods his head in the general direction. Get rid of the bodies. How inbound, Vera asks. Inbound enough you'll wish you woke up earlier, he snaps. Go clean that place up. With a hurried jog, Vera makes her way to the apartment. She is able to make good time, as she has visited the place before. She likely sold the men the drugs that killed them. Once she is within sight of the building, she glances around the perimeter, trying to be unassuming. There is an unusual amount of people loitering around, but judging from their worn faces and ragged clothing, they are locals. Confirming there is no police presence yet, Bear ducks inside. The woman is actually quite fortunate to have a room all to herself where she lives, as this complex makes evident the majority of the people living in Winterton's slums reside in buildings where spaces and appliances are shared. Much of the time, the interior walls are destroyed to a point that privacy simply is not possible. The abundance of holes in the structure means Bear can sight the still men from the entrance. Circling through the room surrounding the dead in a clockwise manner, ensuring she is only the only one present, she eventually approaches the corpses. They are two, in life forty odd years old. Bear wastes no time dragging them into the alleyways adjacent to the apartment, careful to grab any drugs left near the men. Hearing sirens in the distance, the cleaner appreciates the malnourishment and resulting lightness of the bodies. Pulling the limp shades through the rubble littered back streets, she reaches a clearing. The buildings thin and then stop dozens of feet away from a barren cliff. The chocolate-colored soil is moist, overlooking a river that would not be out of place in hell. The air, which seems a, to carry a slight yellow hue, is choking and nauseous. Her eyes watering profusely, her breathing deliberate so that she does not pass out, Bear moves her feet cautiously along the unstable dirt, edging within throwing distance of the bubbling pool. The atmosphere of this place smells of sulfur and burning plastic. There are no living things where this taint reaches. On the horizon, beyond the great fields of sludge and filth, the silhouettes of enormous factories can be seen, mammoth pistons rising and falling ceaselessly around them. One can even, if able to withstand the hostile fumes long enough, make out the wide pipes discharging industrial waste into the river, which itself is already more toxic than the excretion. The flowing substance in the river is mostly a cloudy shade of brown, but in its worst parts can be orange or green. Bracing herself, Bear wraps both hands under the arms of the men, one at a time, and tosses them into the semi-solid stream. As they sink slowly into the vile slime, the edges of their clothes catch briefly on fire before they are submerged. It doesn't always completely dissolve them, but anyone that's been soaking in here isn't going to be a, a much help to a forensics team. So yeah, a bit more dark than the other ones. But hey, maybe that's because it's modern. So the fourth one is the introduction to the fifth one, because the fifth one's like the coup de grace, it's like the longest story uh, it's probably the one I'm the most proud of, but I'll admit I did not quite finish. I got it to 90 pages, like maybe two weeks before the senior project was due, and uh, the plot got really complicated there. Like, the end is like the crescendo, you know, like that's where everything's supposed to go down, and that was where my coolest ideas were supposed to lead in. And as I was rushing to get it done, I realized I couldn't put in everything I wanted to put in with it still making sense. And since it would run against my motivations of doing this to begin with, to just, you know, finish it and not include everything I wanted to, when I wanted to, I was like, let's just, you know, to be continued. I did write over 200 pages, so once again, this is something I would be doing either way. Like, I mean, the senior project is a very handy way to do this, and it gave me a lot of time I needed to make this project into what I wanted to make it into, but I wouldn't be writing these stories anyway, so, you know, that would defeat the purpose. So my process, I write at night mainly, because there's no distractions, you know? You're not, you don't have to go to school, you don't need to go to work, and uh, your family isn't buzzing around, like, Hey, you want some coffee? Or hey, we gotta go to this thing? Or hey, you know what's up? You just sit down and say, hey, what are you doing? But there's nothing wrong with that. But it's very—I have a very hard time writing if I'm focusing on anything else. Like I need perfect focus. So I also have a very bad sleep schedule. So writing at night, you know, complements how I work very well. So I write when motivation strikes. I never am just like, okay, sit down, let's write. Uh, usually, right after I have coffee or I listen to a very good song or like see something interesting, I'm like, hey, that's cool, that's a good idea, I want to make something like that. So every so often I'll get into the mood to write, oftentimes when sometimes I'll be sitting down and I'll be feeling, man, I haven't done anything productive at all, you know, let's, let's make something today, let's do something good. So like I said before, never when I'm angry or sad, because that just doesn't work. So I edit as I go, like, let's say I write five pages, the next day I'll go back, I'll probably edit them, then write maybe three, and then, you know, I'll keep going. But so it's not, it's fairly polished even when I go back for the original like read through. But um, one thing I've noticed as a writer is that when you step back from something for a couple days or a couple weeks and you read it again, it's just a whole, it's a whole different piece. Like you're, it's not the same thing you were seeing before because you're reading it from a different perspective. It is nice writing is one of those things where even if you're the one who wrote it, you can see it as a reader, you know. 
which is another reason that I don't like handing something in, in like a school, because aside from the deadlines, if you write creatively for school, whoever you hand it into is probably going to be a teacher, and they're going to read it not as a reader, they're going to read it as a teacher, as a grader, and I don't like that, because I feel like they're not getting the full experience out of what I wrote, they're not fully appreciating it, because it's like a grade, they have to look for flaws, and I, I don't know, I'm not happy about doing that, I've definitely decided I'm not going to write creatively for school again, not because of the senior project, but because of other things. The senior project was good because I had months to do it, so only the last story was where the stress really kicked in. But things where it's like, hey, write this paper in a week, and creative writing is probably not the best for that. Uh, so as far as research, I don't actually do that much. Most of it comes just straight out of my mind as it hits me. I'd say inspiration is my biggest outside source. Uh, most of the time I just look up synonyms, spellings, and definitions just to make sure it's concise. If it's something like science fiction or more realistic, I'll look up a fact or like a scientific thing to make sure that it makes sense. I mean, as long as it's, you know, consistent and all that. I don't try too hard to you know, go by templates or, uh, you know, adhere to established traditions and stuff. I just write what comes to my mind in the way I want it to be written and then just make sure it's readable. So, I'm going to read the excerpt from the fourth story, which is the introduction story to the next one. On the outskirts of a forest, brightly lit by the afternoon sun, is a small wooden outpost. It consists of a worn interior with packed earth floors, sheltered by a drooped ceiling. The roof is small and triangular to help keep off the weight of snow, though such a thing is not an issue this time of year. A bench wide enough for three is attached to one of the shack's outside walls, and another inside to provide a comfortable way to view the surrounding nature, or to allow escape from the rain, as the weather dictates. Inside are three rows of cabinets to hold under the goods of visitors, perhaps so that someone else may pick them up, or simply for safekeeping. Only honor prevents the theft of items stored this way. The stop is just to the side of a dirt road. Grass encroaches upon the edges of the path, having been out of use for many decades now, though it remains complete enough for travel. Mild winds scatter verdant leaves through the air, the round trees near the trail weighed down by the excesses of spring. A man and a woman stand outside of the post. They are both young, the man appearing into, to be in his early thirties, the woman in her twenties. The man wears the thick, heavily laden clothes of a traveling merchant. They are brown and trimmed with pale yellow, made mostly of light furs. His short, shaggy brown hair is uncovered. A large gray pack is slung over his back, from which he retrieves a smaller bag, which sags with the weight of apples, fish, meat, and other assorted foods, all kept preserved by seasonings and separated by yet smaller packages. On the other hand, the woman wears a slim, masculine leather jacket lined with a multitude of pockets. A white wool hat fits over her head, her medium-length, straight brown hair extending out from it. Her dark gray pants are formal and flat. The outfit is well suited to her thin, thin frame. Her pale blue eyes are large and kind. 350 ten arcs, the man requests, handing the woman the supplies. His voice is soft and gives an impression of wisdom. She reaches into one of the many folds of her jacket, retrieving 600 coins and exchanging them for the food. You always give us such a generous discount, she says with a small smile. Thank you. The woman's voice is fairly deep, but gentle. She speaks in a refined way. And you always grossly overpay me, he replies, pocketing the cash. I would be a poor trader if I passed up such a lucrative opportunity. I wonder, then, why you are the only merchant that happens this way, the woman muses. The man smiles as he waves in farewell. Perhaps others fear the name of things, regardless of their substance, he suggests. I'm talking about the forest, of course. Of course, the woman agrees. Goodbye. Her hands holding the groceries to her body, she watches him as he goes. Once the vendor has disappeared back into the forest, the woman begins walking in the opposite direction. Her fitted brown boots leave small marks onto the dusty ground. Calmly, she looks up at the sky. It is blue and cloudless. I should draw something, she remarks quietly. The path becomes more and more overgrown with roots and greenery until finally the woman is forced from the road. Making her way through the ankle-length grass, she climbs up a gradually sloping hill. She notices a rabbit watching her off to the side. The sparse woodland gives way as the elevation increases until a long cliff can be seen on the other side of the hill, its edges illuminated under the sun. The land ends here, rough waves smashing into jagged rocks marking the bottom of the wall. And atop the ocean cliffs, built into their farthest and lowest quadrant, is a mighty castle. So, I have one more excerpt to read from the uh, major story, and then I was planning on doing some question and answer. I don't actually have any more like process details to go over before this one, so I'm just going to hop into it. So, at some point, after the prince single-handedly eliminates any further incursions into the city while the defenses are secured, the commander of the guard has rallied his men behind the sovereign, and the mayor has addressed, uh, directed the population into the sturdiest buildings of serve attire. About time, the royalty comments. The prince, having leapt onto a balcony of the town hall which overlooks most of the city, glances down at the men lined up in front of him. He recognizes that they are 100,000, roughly one-third of the people that live in the city. 
These are the starry-eyed men that have raised their shields to defend the city from the mythical demons, the evil that the prince himself is unsure to face. Demons, he, th he thinks with incredulity. Why now? Why here? He clicks his tongue. Now is not the time for that, he mutters. The militia are not weak, untested boys. They are the Imperial Guard, holding metal tower shields nearly as tall and broad as their bodies on their left arms, and blade spears in their right hands. Their sectioned armor is inferior only to plate and protection, glimmering with the characteristic golden dye of the Empire's armed forces. You are children, the prince begins, shaking his head hopelessly. Even if you have been fighting your whole lives, you are children. Since you were born, every morsel of food, every droplet of water that has met your mouths has come from the Empire. She is your mother. You are not independence. The prince narrows his eyes, and the tone of his voice grows immeasurably more serious. He is no longer mocking, no longer acting superior. He pronounces his words genuinely. Do you wish to make up your debt? Do you wish to be a true man to your girlfriends and wives? Now is your chance. He takes a deep breath. A horrible, timeless enemy has appeared. One that I, even as heir to the throne, have admittedly scarcely heard of beyond how terrible they are. The demons have returned. Those formless enemies that nearly destroyed the entire world aeons before, they have materialized here again. The prince smiles and closes his eyes. You and me, he says, shaking his head, we are helpless idiots. A powerful, deep chant replies to him. The ranks yell in assent. We do not know anything important. Sure, we may be educated, as the richest of you are, as I am, but we are still young, and certainly none of us have faced demons. I will not lie to you and claim that I know why they are here. I woke up in the morning completely unaware of the danger that would confront me this day. He points at the crowd and bellows, just as you. They repeat their chant, whatever it is. The men are one body, pledged to the air. Die and obligate the empire to pay compensation to your families, the prince grimly orders. Our city is besieged by an enemy that none of us can comprehend. We will not escape this and tell the story to our grandchildren. Our corpses will line the walls. The stench of our decomposition will attract notice to these grounds. Yora, the young men, the warriors, shout in unison. It is an old imperial word that means unafraid of death. The prince raises his sword far above his head. To glory, he shouts, his voice almost angry. Over the walls, from his regal vantage point, he can see hordes of violet demons gathered to the front of the insignificant city, which he was only placed in by his father to teach him about leadership. In truth, the prince had never experienced true battle before eliminating the sparse demons that made it into the city roughly an hour before. To glory, the militia shouts back, the men solidified in their courage. We stand here, outnumbered ten to one, the prince murmurs with a dry smile. He estimates, from the span of monsters, that there are at least one million present. Ha! Huh, maybe we should have run. So that's it for what I have to read today. Uh, any questions about you know my process content? And uh, first of all, my name is Brendan Steiner. I'm an English teacher. Nice to meet you. Nobody we've ever met. Um, you definitely have a, a palpable enthusiasm for the writing process, and I, that, that's very uh, inspirational, to be honest. Thank you. Um, I just I want to I want to press you on, on one thing. You, you, you I, I jotted down a few notes here. You talk about how you writing you really see it as something that you do for yourself. Uh, you don't want to write for deadlines, and I, 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 don't, I definitely don't blame you. Um, you don't generally sit down to write. You wait for the the inspiration to come to you. Uh, you you're not too enthusiastic about uh, entering a creative writing program because you think that the greater is below the flaws. Um, and I would just, I, I question um, whether you've thought of, a, of any sort of formal way that you could continue your, your journey as a writer. And if you've thought about that at all, if there's any, any sort of formal organization that you can see yourself being a part of, whether it's a, 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 by formal, it could be an informal group of friends sitting around, uh, fellow writers. Have, have you thought of any way to sort of make a community for yourself? I plan on joining some kind of, probably like a fruit light writer's club or group in college, I imagine they would have something like that where kids that just like to write could probably hand stuff around and comment on it. I also am maybe considering uploading stuff like online, like maybe having starting like a blog or something or maybe my own website just uploading things that I write there just for people to see. Uh, I, ha I haven't really thought it over much further than that. I would like to make like more copies of the things I've written because some of my friends have expressed interest in reading things and I just right. don't have a printer so it's hard for me to get things around. So yeah, I mean I. I haven't th thought about it in depth, but it's something I'm definitely will probably pursue more in the future. So yeah. Okay. I have a comment and a question about the creative writing class. I hope that you change your mind and you do take one because it's not that they're going to critique you and say what's wrong, but I think they would make you a stronger writer. I, I meant, so mm. don't close the door entirely. On that point, I meant more like in 
my experience with creative writing for a school has been high school English class. Right. So that's more about like mechanics. It will be very stuff. different. Yeah. I, 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 just, you know. yeah. No, I don't. I don't believe I said that. Well, actually. I mean, I just don't want you to be totally yeah. turned off. Yet. I wouldn't write. I wouldn't write. Criticism creative. can be positive. Right. I know so. that. I wouldn't write yes. creatively for an academic class. Okay. I should better I, phrase. Yes. If okay. it was a creative writing class, that would be a different story. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. I'm curious to know what writers influenced your writing. Do you have some that you just? I haven't actually read that well, who much. Did you, who did you like when you were growing up? Uh, who were some writers that sort of... Well, I really liked uh, Catcher in the Rye, because mm -hmm. um, I could really empathize with that guy at that period of my life. But um, as far I, most of my inspiration comes either from music or like comics or TV shows I'll watch. A lot of it's like kind of like graphic mm -hmm. or visual stuff, you know, because mm -hmm. if you read my stuff, it's kind of like lighthearted like pops from place to place and it's action-y like you can kind of tell there's like a visual inspiration to it i wouldn't say it's not like hard dense writing most of it like the densest stuff is like the environmental <coughs> descriptions and stuff so i wouldn't say that i've been heavily inspired by actual novels or literature i have a question going along with um mr Stein, steiner's um what a question um so obviously you do want to pursue writing as you kind of move through, you know, college. And have you? I mean, are you thinking about going into writing as some kind of career, perhaps, or in any other sort of form, like submitting short stories to magazines or you know things like that? From what I understand, it it's difficult to make a living doing nothing but writing. So I plan on pursuing it as a hobby throughout college, and maybe when I'm out and I have free time, I might try to get stuff published, but. Once again, that isn't my goal, and if I manage to get that to work, it would just be a bonus. So at this point, I'm not considering getting any kind of money out of my writing, but you know, I will probably once again think about that more in depth in the future. Um, okay, another question. Uh, did you have, of the five short stories you wrote, was there a favorite that you had among them? I like them all in different ways, because they're not all the same story. <coughs> so, I mean, I wrote stories because I got an inspiration I really liked and wanted to create something out of it for each one. Like, it's not like I sat down and I'm like, what can I write about? Like, I have like 60 stories I haven't written because the ideas will just come to me, I'll jolt them down, I'll write like five pages of an intro and then not touch it for years, you know? I've, so I, that was my problem. Before I started the senior project, I only wrote two stories that I actually finished and probably over 400 pages that just unfinished stories because I did write consistently from middle school where I wrote my first story. And I've uh, evolved well, much as a writer since then, which has become evident just reading the two things recently. But yeah, uh, where was I going with this? I don't know if you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds good. I was, just, I was curious as to which one of those pieces were your favorite. Um, but again, again, I figured an answer would be something to the effect of. I, like, I, I probably like the last one because it's the most grand story I've written. It's mm -hmm. like the longest, the plot's the most complicated, and there's a lot of characters. So yeah, I'm probably the most proud of that one. I like them all. Do you think you see yourself in any of the characters that you write about? No. None of my characters are based on people I know or myself. Okay. Right. They are based on like my ideals, though. I sure. don't write characters I don't like. I have trouble with that. Is that what you <laughs> Just, the, well, first is a comment that, knowing you a little bit anyway, um, that your, your style and all the things that you said about the way you write and not needing like all the things you said that went into the whole process, mm -hmm. it fits your personality. Yeah. And I don't mean that negatively. No, it's I just you write the way you are, mm -hmm. who you are as a person. Yeah. Um, and I, I, sometimes people can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, did you work with any mentors at all, either in school or, or out of school? Uh, I, gave, I gave my mom and Mr. McGrath a copy of everything I uh, wrote, and they looked it over and gave me some pointers. I did not get any professional help, really. I just kind of wrote things as they came to me. Okay. Um, do you think you'll try to publish what you've done, since those are finished now? I will probably try to publish okay. some of these. There's also some a lot of online ones I yeah. want to interrupt that, because I know of someone who writes some stories, and she publishes some of her books online. It's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. It, it is something I will definitely look into later, but probably not until I'm at least out of high school. Well, that's only a couple weeks, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I just lost. Oh, one of the things I was thinking about is that you said you play a lot of video games, right? A lot. And to me, a lot of the stories, or a lot of the stories that you did, 
you could almost write for somebody to design a game if you didn't want to do it yourself. Mm. And I don't do a lot of video game stuff, but it seems like a lot of it would be fitting to, you know, tweaking it here and there, mm. but you could actually make, someone could make a game out of what you're doing. I've also considered so, that as well. That's something yeah. that I think would be like amazing, but you need some pretty serious resources to do like what I would envision. But the biggest thing with that is that for me doing a collaborative work, it's not wholly mine anymore. I feel like I don't, yeah, either, true. first of all, have the rights to it, but second of all, I'm like, I don't like, it's again going into, I might not have as much of an in, uh, input on the outcome of this thing. Like, I, I don't want the story to end this way, but if there's another guy that like owns half the thing, he's like, well, I do, and yeah, I just don't want to get in that situation. But I don't know anything about coding, so if I ever did want to do that. But you might be able to make some money selling the story to somebody who wants to make the game. You've written the story, and the story yeah. is yours, and yours yeah. alone. Yeah, yeah. The game becomes somebody else's and let it go. <laughs> you know, so somebody else is doing the game part. But anyway, it was just a thought as I was listening to um, what you said. But you did, I mean, that's an amazing job. You mm -hmm. spent the time that you were supposed to spend on, you know, the senior project, and, and uh, I applaud you for that. So, uh, Thank you. Along with it, I'd like to, I want to read them here. Oh yeah, I mean, I only have one copy called Dibs, I guess. <laughs> I can share it with people online if you want. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, yeah. okay, do that. Yeah. All right. So, uh, the last couple of years in school, we've had the Writers Workshop, like, week, Writers Week. Have you um, gone to any of those sessions with the writer, local writers? It's always something I've wanted to go to, but for one reason or another, I don't. I mean, I don't know, high school's been busy for me this year with what senior college is, senior project, and wow, I was told that the classes got easier senior year. No, they don't, no, no, it's not relaxed here at all, okay. Not even now, I got like two papers due that are like due before the last day of school, so I'm gonna figure that out. But I live next to one of the guys, so. Yeah, I've just been holding things together at this point. And also, up my left, there's a, a writer's workshop group, or there's a couple of them, I think. Nancy, what's her name? Oh, Arani. Arani. Arani has a writer's workshop where people get together and share their work and um, give feedback, and it's not the same thing as a teacher grading you. Yeah. I think it's a good process. Mm -hmm. um, I think, didn't there used to be like a bed and breakfast place where mm -hmm. someone would host? Something like that, yeah. Cynthia Riggs, um, maybe, would host yeah. writers from all over to come and, and Check that out. We have a lot of incredible resources here on Seattle that now that you're not going to be in school, you can ask for. All right. And uh, I thought you're incredibly um, bright and articulate. And where are you going to college? Uh, UMass Amherst. Uh -huh. That's great. Uh -huh. That's great. Nearby, not too much larger than here. Some trees around. So mm -hmm. that's nice. Great. Anyway, I, I was uh, I just want to make a comment that it's it was been a pleasure uh, you know talking to you about your, your writing and uh, in, in having been able to read some of these stories. I, I really hope that you, you're able to share them with more people because I think it's uh, I think a lot of, everyone here would probably agree they'd like to read them. Yeah. Um, I want to, I have to read the last one though. That's the big one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, there's a bunch of things I want to ask, but the one thing I, I was wondering if you could share. Um, remember when you were talking about your process? about how you picture stuff in your head and how that gets on the paper. I remember you were saying something about how you actually see things mm. and you write, it's a very visual way yeah. of doing it. For me, when I write, it's not just like, okay, let's come up with a plot. Usually I'll envision something in my head, like if it's like a fight scene, I, I, can, I can see it, you know, and I know what the characters look like, and it's more transcribing from my mind than it is generating words for me. Writing is probably like a visual imaginative process. Like the last story was inspired by a dream I actually had. It was just the scene in the dream was so cool. I'm like, where did this even come from? I gotta write a story. So it's stuff like that. If I, I yeah, visuals motivate most of my stories. Like if I see a character in something I think looks really cool, I might want to like emulate that in some way. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's fascinating because, especially since you were talking about how you're inspired by video games and comics, and there's a lot of very visual um, inspiration mm -hmm. behind the, the writing. I think that's really uh, interesting. And it, it might be um, um, unique among a, a lot of your peers that you might meet as, as you hopefully get into some of these uh, writing uh, groups. So I think that's, I, I, I think I agree, I think that's a really, be a really great experience. Um, and if it's not, you just leave too, you know. It's, it's not like you're dropping out, you just, you just walk away. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you though is I think that, I, you're definitely someone that has a lot to say, and you have a lot that you want to um, to tell people, not only through your, your fiction writing, but I think through 
just in life in general. So I, I just I just hope that you find something like a profession that allows you to do that. Um, and I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about where you, where it might lead. I know it's you know it might be after college or what, but um, uh, I think there's some professions that also would allow you to maybe write, have this be part of your job, if not your sole job, yeah. that might allow you to, to uh, be able to afford groceries. <laughs> so what have you thought of that? Right. I'm not, I'm not that, uh, like I said, I'm not very passionate about things that aren't writing. I haven't decided on a career yet, but for me it's mostly just making the money so I can do what I want in my free time. So I, I think I should probably put more thought into it than that. I shouldn't just go for the first job that seems decent because I would like to enjoy it, but the, the only things that like I enjoy doing are either non-productive or this, and I don't think I could make much money out of those, but I'm sure there is something that would fit, and you're right, I do need to do more searching for that, but I'm undecided right now, so. I just want to encourage you in college that if there's not an established writing group, start one, hmm. because every college has they actually have funding set aside for clubs and people every year, freshmen, decide they're going to have a, I don't know, Simpsons watching club or whatever. And they, they write it up, they present it, and they get funding that pays for their pizzas while they watch for whatever. So, so start one. If you don't find one, start it yourself, and you will find like-minded kids to join you. That's a good idea. Amherst is a pretty big school, so mm -hmm. there probably will be one, but if there isn't, I will. Well, one, you may not like it, you may be on the Right, I may not like the community. That's you right. may be like writing club number two. <laughs> Alternative. The real writers. Right. Well, thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.